the U.S. Senate. And by the way, we are live streams and we do YouTube videos. So behave yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is my first time at this luncheon and I appreciate it. My name is Stephanie Phillips and I am running for the United States Senate here in Nevada. And I have lived in Las Vegas for 30 years. I've been in the real estate business that whole time. I own my own company and started that about 19 years ago. I'm a Blue Star mom. I have two kids. They are 18 and 21. And I also have a nonprofit that helps hungry kids, trafficked kids. And I've been involved in many children's charities for over 30 years. Children, veterans, accountability, those are at the top of my platform. Children, we need to protect. We see what they're doing to them in our school system with this ideology that they are pushing down their throats. We see that boys are being put in their locker room, private spaces. We need to protect them. We also see trafficking has gone up exponentially in this country. America is the number one consumer of this, and there are estimated 2 million kids that are held as sex slaves, and estimated 6 to 8 million across the world. So we need to pay more attention to this. I don't see a lot of elected officials talking about this. I plan to change that. Veterans, more so than any other group, they call me, and they tell me their experiences with the VA. There are a lot of things that we need to improve and work on for our veterans. Accountability in Washington, we don't seem to have much. They are spending our money recklessly. They are not protecting our border in our country. They are allowing an invasion into our country. I call that treason. I plan to secure the border in the Senate if it is not secure by the time I get there. Hey. Also, I am for term limits. I've signed the term limit pledge. <laughs> that that would fix a lot of things in Washington. I would also support a national voter ID law. We need that desperately. Also, a national CCW law. Do you get a CCW in one state? It's good for all. I have a CCW in Nevada and I have one for a long time. I will protect your Second Amendment rights as well as uphold and defend the Constitution. I will never support or vote for vaccine mandates, mask mandates, or lockdowns. We saw this was one of the main reasons I hopped into politics, is because they locked us down, they shut small businesses. I'm a small business owner. I'm going to protect small businesses. They deemed us non-essential. They muzzled our kids and us and closed our schools and churches. I won't stand for that. I will never support that. There are many things that we need to work on in this country. We're at the brink of losing our country. And I have stood up and I want to represent Nevada for the right reasons because I see far too often these candidates, the off of these races, they're recycled candidates, they're opportunists, they're carpetbaggers, and they are bought and paid for by the DC establishment and mega donors. They are not going to represent us, they are merely going to be puppets for who owns them. So I am a political outsider. This is my first race, and it's the best thing about me. I'm not owned by anybody. I have true intentions, genuine intentions. I'm a true Nevada, and I intend to represent Nevada for the right reasons. Thank you so much. Very good, so I really get a good time with people. Thank you. <laughs> and I will do it with you. I guess I've got to get over here so we can get out of here. Uh, Marge, you're up now. Marge is going to get a little boring. I don't know. I don't know. Marge, you're going to running for county. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. I did respond and tell you when you just didn't answer me. Anyway, 
<laughs> At any rate, I am running for, my name is Marcia Burke Fiddler, and I'm running for uh, County Commission District 1, which is basically the west side of the valley, Incline Village, um, uh, Heard Eye, Mogul, all, all the way to the state line. And uh, so it's um, historically been a relatively conservative area of the city, of the county. Um, it is not necessarily so conservative now, it's more independent. All of our California people are moving in, and so it's a much more independent community. And they're concerned about a lot of the same things that all of us are concerned about. Our schools, I can't tell you the number of times I've had the question asked of me, what are you, What can you do about the school district and what they're teaching our children? And unfortunately, the county um, commission does not control the school district, the board does. What the county commission does control is who gets on that board. And um, so I think that's the direction that we have to go to fix this. Is we've got to replace a lot of the people who are on the board for the county. And that's definitely one thing I'll be working on. With the exception of this gentleman who's sitting down here, who you all know is probably the most conservative guy and doing a superb job. <laughs>
please support me if you want to volunteer. I have a sign up list. If you um, want to donate, you can donate on my website. And please support me because when I vote, it's not just for Ward 3. It is for the city of Reno. And we need to get the city of Reno back. So thank you very much. I forgot one person that came in later, Roger Edwards, president of the Republican Party. I'm going to remind you, we voted November 8th, vet, salute to veterans here, starts at 11.30. So we appreciate it. But I, and there's over 15 or more people that didn't sign up, which is great. Appreciate it. But please sign up. We were a little messed up this month because we have had two events. We had a dinner at the Atlanta Center, which we had a lot of people, and now we're doing the lunch. So bear with us. The age will be good. And from now on, starting next year, we're going to do the lunches the first Thursday, dinners the third Thursday, but all the day. The lunches will be every month. And January the 18th, we're doing the candidate for U.S. Senate debates for the key people like Seth, Bill, and uh, Jeff Gunter, and, and Tony Brady are all committed. The only, I doubt if we'll get Sam. Because, uh, never mind, I give a Sam. Anyway, with that in mind, today we're going to do a little different. We have a guest host, and he has three guests. He's going to run it. You all know Mike Clark, County Commissioner. Mike, take it away. Mike. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for hosting this, and uh, for you and uh, Mr. Conrad as well. Always uh, supportive of. Uh, the local public political scene here. So thanks for sponsoring this. And that's your water. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Mike Clark, County Commission, District 2. I'm going to talk a little bit, just a few moments from me. This, this meeting is really about me. It's about other folks that I've seen in the community that are doing a good job. Uh, many times I question uh, the county and what they're doing and why they're doing things. And to just be uh, asking the word simple question of why uh, makes them very irritated. I don't know why that is. But if somebody asks me a question about some some reason, some, something that I'm doing, and ask why, I'd be happy to explain that. I don't uh, get uh, snarly about it, snarky about it, but, but that's just, just me. So I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things that are, that are near and dear to my heart here in the county. Um, the homeless situation, we need to have a, you know, just an honest discussion about what's really taking place there. Is there good outcomes? Uh, how many folks are in this condition? How can we help these people? Are the funds being used the best way? Uh, we just uh, we need to take a look at that. We've got uh, another person here who's uh, the chairman of the senior uh, advisory board in the county and also a uh, county member of liaison with that board. So that's you know, the seniors and homeless. So what we're going to try and keep the topics to today. I've asked uh, uh, Monica Dupay to uh, sit next to me. She's going to answer some questions. She she runs uh, some nonprofits. She's got some good outcomes. She's got some questions on why the county does things a certain way, maybe not the way that she would do it. I've got Lily Barron sitting next to her. She's with the ACLU, and she's uh, like, "Well, what's what's that all about?" She works with the the homeless. She personally goes out in the middle of the night in any case somebody needs a room and finds them a hotel and I find them very admirable. The other thing is she finds she's got some questions about how the county is handling the homeless issue. And if you think about it as a taxpayer, if the county isn't doing something right and the county gets sued and the county has to settle with somebody, guess who gets paid that? Take a look in the mirror, take a look around the, the taxpayers. So Lily's trying to uh, help the county do some things the correct way, and of course, the county doesn't always want to listen to her. So 
She's here in the next room, but she does. Uh, yeah, we've got Hava Ahmad. Uh, as I have mentioned, she is uh, works works with me. She's recently become an attorney here in town. She passed the bar, so she's a legal expert uh, for this panel. I'm so proud. Of her. I'm so proud. Of her. She's done a great job on many different levels, but I get a chance to work with her as chair of the senior advisory board. She's passionate about senior activities, senior quality of life. So they're going to talk a little bit, each of them. Uh, we'll have some questions and answers. But uh, this, again, is not about me. This is about finding out what others think of the way your county is operating. Maybe we can move the needle just a little bit. You know, I'm not a perfectionist. I don't expect everything to be perfect. But what I do expect is some movement in the right direction. I want to try and move that needle a little bit each time we're at the path and make, make things happen in, their, in a positive way versus just doing things the same old way and expecting different results. So I'm going to have Monica talk about her perspective, what she does. She's got a, a, a great nonprofit. She's got a, a new project coming out of the ground. I was there for the groundbreaking. It's, uh, she's got a, a Kind of a group home, and I'll let her explain it a bit more. But she's got youth, young people there with seniors, both, both age groups living in the same same complex. So you know, there's some some shared uh, knowledge between the generations. I think it's just a great idea. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Monica. She'll speak for a few moments, maybe four or five minutes, and then we'll move on to Lily, and then Holly will be back. So here we go. Wow. Wow, that was a lot. Um, homelessness is just very complicated and complex. That's the first thing that I can let you know. There's no silver bullet, there's no magic potion, there's no one size fits all. So this pursuit of the one size fits all uh, is fruitless. It's, we're never gonna we're never gonna create a building where everyone goes into it and then they come out changed people. It's just not going to happen. Uh, which is why we ended up going down the route of working with a behavioral psychologist. So I opened up the Nevada Youth Empowerment Project in 2007. We wanted to help young people get jobs, finish high school, and make homes of their own. Um, how do you do that uh, with an at-risk population or a population that's maybe dealing with mental illness, drug addiction, um, a lot of adversity from their childhood? How do we help them overcome that in a period of time with an array of services? So we started working on that, and I worked with a behavioral psychologist to make sure that I wasn't just trying things. I was actually doing the right things that would lead to the outcome that I wanted. Um, and we were private funded at NEF, so we don't receive any government dollars, um, which puts me in a good position to be able to call the county out or to ask the county questions about why they're doing uh, certain approaches. So currently, um, we use an approach at NEF which is very individualized. So we meet with each individual girl, um, she fills out a social history, and then we create a plan that is based on her skills, her talents, and her interests. So we start helping her finish school, we help her get a good paying job, we help her move into a place of her own. Um, through this work, I had uh, did the homeless youth count for eight years for the city of Reno, which culminated in the opening of the Andy House. And so that work did get us a new shelter. But we don't have great leadership right now on how do you solve someone's homelessness at a shelter. And so we adopted a built for zero approach, uh, which is an approach being used in other parts of the country. And there's four steps to the approach. Well, we quit working at step two. So we did first step, we did second step in our county, but we failed to do step three and step four. Mm -hmm. And that's where the individualized work comes in. And we're kind of stumped and stuck there right now in our CARES camp. And I'm not quite sure how they're going to get over that hump. Uh, but I can't wait for the government. Uh, no one's coming to save us. And so I have created the NEA program, which is a 14 bed facility. We also have uh, graduate housing, and now we're into building our own uh, low income housing. In Nevada, we are, I think, pretty much worse in the nation on having enough low-income units for the people who need it. So for every, uh, for people at 100% AMI, we have 95 for every 100 units that we need. For people at 30% AMI, we have 17 for every 100 units that we need. So the government's lack of prioritizing these populations 
um, and instead upping the subsidy AMI, we're now uh, subsidizing projects at 120% AMI. These are people that are making 20% over 100% AMI and we're subsidizing projects like that. Um, so we just have to get back and get accountable. I like that word accountable. But having a prioritization and saying, you know, these are the neediest people with the least amount of resources. So that's where our tax dollars should be going, not at higher uh, AMIs where people have access to more resources and they're more capable. So there's a lot of things that we're like misstepping uh, in our decision making and our leadership that's basically leading us to these outcomes that we're experiencing right now. And so I'll pass it over to that. Thank you so much, Monica is one of my heroes. My name is Lily Barron. Thank you for having me. Um, I, too, share the same concerns. In fact, um, earlier last year, was it last year? Wow. Earlier last year, uh, myself, Monica, and um, another uh, friend and uh, co cohort that we work with, Katie Colling, wrote, um, a, a white paper regarding this issue and evaluating several of the programs that we have. If anyone would like to access that white paper, we're happy to uh, disseminate it to your group because I think that it's very enlightening. What we're seeing right now is, uh, to be really frank, uh, misappropriation of funds uh, through the county and the city. And I've done quite a bit of research um, along with some other folks as well as um, a lot of work on the ground to try to figure out why it is that we have doubled the amount of people who die from exposure to the elements living outside while simultaneously getting a hundred million federal dollars at the same time. We should have seen, we have a graph saying deaths going like this as well as federal funding going like this. From where I'm sitting, from my vantage point, it should look like this. If we apply a hundred million dollars to your house, your house should not collapse. <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense. So to be perfectly frank, where's the money? Is my question. And it's I believe where Mike Clark and I have fallen in love on that question. <laughs> because no one will answer the question. Uh, so, and it's and it's not funny. Uh, recently the, the city filed um, our paper report, which is our consolidated annual performance evaluation report. And there were some numbers uh, on that that were frankly not correct. There were programmings, uh, programming that uh, does not exist, that the city reported exists, that the county signs off on. There were uh, numbers that were absolutely incorrect, as well as self-evaluation saying that we're meeting about one to six percent of what we sought out to do as far as a success rate. It's a self-report to the federal government. Now the problem here is you can't actually lie to them and get and get away with it. You might be able to get away with that at a county level and you might be able to get away with that at the city level. However, um, to Mike's point about you know litigation and you know, settlements coming out of our pockets, I'm quite concerned that mis misreporting and misuse of funds will put us as taxpayers in a position to be paying for a very big mistake that we could have prevented. Um, the CARES campus right now is 43% people who are disabled and 43% people who are seniors. So what is it actually? I also do a lot of work within the criminal justice system and within the uh, prisons, and I can say, frankly, that there is more programming in uh, the Nevada Department corrections than there is in our hundred million dollar tents that we've erected for people who are experiencing homelessness and they think it's an absolute tr atrocity. These people did not commit any crime and they are being treated as if they are you know refugees from the from the place where they live. These people are constituents whether or not they have homes and they and I intend to help them vote this this uh, upcoming election in within their best interest. So I think that right now what we need to do as a community is come together to ask these tough questions and have better evidence-based, scientific research-based uh, solutions to these problems that people do solve. For instance, uh, Monica Hunter talked about the Build for Zero program. 
Uh, we have that program, and we also have it, they have it in Bakersfield as well. And they've had it for almost the same amount of time. They are at net zero homelessness. We are skyrocketing. So it is not even that we don't have some of the programming in place, it's that we are not utilizing it correctly. We do not have the proper oversight, and we do not have subject matter expert, experts in the field. So those are some of the things that we're working on together, and I think that we can absolutely solve these problems together, but we need to hold these folks accountable. And we need to keep a good eye on our federal funding that we received, of that one-time huge amount of money, and our tax Hello everyone. So that was a good so, uh, can, I, can I jump in real quick and then I'll yeah. you know, lead you in something? I mean, so I appreciate what Willie has to say about about it's, it's the political will and it's the mismanagement, in my opinion. And as citizens, you should demand an audit of exactly what's taking place in the financial part of it. And we should also ask for an audit on what's taking place on, as far as handling and caring and, and uh, training and working with the people. So it's one thing, the financial thing is, is one thing, but the actual outcomes and, and, and quality uh, uh, help for people, that, that's the big issue. We need quality help for the folks that can't be helped. It's as simple as that. Uh, now we're gonna let uh, Oliver on the, real quick before that, as the county commissioner, this county, you've heard, maybe you've heard me say this before, this county spends about seven to eight million dollars on seniors. This county, as you just heard from uh, Lily, spends over a hundred million dollars on the, on the CARES camp. This county spends 14 million dollars on animal control. The fastest growing segment of the population, a large segment of the population, are seniors, about 20-25 percent of the folks in this your seniors. We are not doing enough for the seniors. So, uh, uh, Hava has been very helpful. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Hava now. She'll tell you what she sees. Again, as a trained attorney and, and, and understands the laws, what she sees, and how we can best serve seniors. Thank you, Hava. So, I know quite a few of you have come to some of my senior meetings and you've seen kind of how long they get because I like to ask them. There are certain questions that Commissioner Clark asks and doesn't get answers to, and there's questions that I ask that I sometimes get answers to. So, the Senior Division is under the Human Services Agency, which just recently had the Cures Campus moved under it. So, prior to about three, four weeks ago, it was under the County Director's Office. And my only comment when it comes to the massive amount of spending that has occurred from the lifetime grants that were never meant to establish a new program is that it would be a shame if someone were to complain to the Office of Inspector General of the Feds or not. And I'm just going to put that out there, and I'm probably going to get a lot of that flash for that. So it is what it is. So one of the things, and my board has had its ups and downs, and we've had our power essentially limited, and still I'm always the person that gets every phone call for any issues that occur at the senior center. I have people public commenting about the fact that we have um, individuals get bus or transported from the Cures campus to the senior centers in the daytime. So then I have my seniors that utilize the center that are taxpayers that get very upset about the fact that the programming that's offered to them isn't able to be offered to them. One of the kind of biggest things that we do have to discuss here today is that it's not just homeless seniors. That homelessness aspect is, you know, worst case scenario. Our seniors are not not just homeless, they have fixed incomes and social security does not increase and it has not increased. And when you have increasing rent, when you have increasing food costs, increasing gas, it makes everyone's budget significantly less. And the programming that we offer to our seniors is not supplementing those massive um, expense increases, increases because of inflation. Then we have a second segment and that's like the cusp of homelessness, right? And those are our seniors that may qualify for things like Section 8. But at the end of the day, the homemakers programs, so the programs that case managers going in to make sure you have access to your groceries and to your medication, we just don't have enough case managers locally. And because the state cut the program, it's now only a county program, and we haven't been able to really truly discuss with our county what they're doing. <laughs> we haven't been able to um, understand what best practices are. 
And this isn't anything on the, the staff in the services agency, because I truly really believe that leadership comes from the top down. And then, of course, we have our, our homeless seniors. And like was explained, 43% in the Paris campus, but that entire number of seniors makes up 110,000 members of our county. So we are an ADRP, age-friendly community now. We are in the process of planning. But something that's come up over and over again is the fact that there are members of our community that put together a master plan of aging, for aging, excuse me, in 2014 that was never approved by the county. So now because we are an age-friendly community, we're like, hey, we need to talk about our current age population and as they continue aging, because it is the fastest growing portion of our population. And sadly, and I'm gonna get in trouble for this, guys, so call all of you to support me. The elder services pamphlet is not sufficient to give all of our seniors services. Calling a HUD or an about rural housing authority isn't gonna magically get you into that. And I wish that it was. So something that we've been doing lately, and this is, goes all across the county, and I know some of you have pulled this survey out, but we're asking seniors what their top priorities are. And so far, one of the biggest issues that has come up, and this is the top issue, is housing. And it's not just the cost of housing like, all together, it's everything from availability and accessibility. So when we talk about seniors and senior homelessness, we're really looking at how can we address this with all of the other issues we have. We have issues with access to medical care, we have issues with access to food and food scarcity, especially for our seniors. So we have to look at the bigger picture. So starting this next month, goes uh, the number first. My, I have a special subcommittee of associate members that's putting through a, a plan from everything that the county has accomplished from that 2014 master plan, which is not much. It's mainly been volunteer based. And things that need to happen. So every meeting now is going to highlight one goal. So in March of 2024 is going to be our big kind of panel and discussion on affordability and accessible housing. What needs to be discussed then is also voucher programs for individuals that are on fixed incomes, who are in areas with high rents or high rent increases. How do you make up the difference? We have to talk about, hey, what do we do with the people on the street? Because it's, we can't necessarily offer the same services that the senior center offers to everyone. We have to make sure that those services are catered to what the needs are. So I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's, I, I wish that there was a solution. It's, I, I can give you all of the problems in the world, but I need every single person to continue to talk about the fact that seniors are not just a talking point during election cycles. Seniors are like a, a value portion of our community that we have to continue addressing the issues for. And that's something just, that just has not been done. And the last thing I do want to touch on is isolation, because we haven't figured out as a county or as any type of government agency to quite understand the impact of isolation. And whether or not you agree with what happened during the pandemic, which I'm sure most people in this room don't, but we have impacts that were created by that isolation that we now have to address. And all of us can say that we know another senior that is isolated. They're not gonna talk about what they need or the services that they need. They're not gonna even talk about what they see as deficiencies. So the more my big ask for you is to talk to every senior that you find and ask them, hey, how's stuff going? What do you need and how can we get there? And when it comes down to all of this misappropriation of funds, my other like request for you is to, I, I need hawks, I need people watching the county to make sure that we don't start moving money from our senior budget, that is specifically aimed towards seniors, into only homelessness, because that money is being utilized at its fullest as it is. So what we do need to do is apply for more grants federally to ensure that the homeless are addressed specifically on the CARES campus, but one of the biggest issues though too is we have to ask, and everyone needs to be asking every elected official, where did the money go? Because if you and I had hundred million or $180 million to spend, I can tell you it wouldn't be a 10. And I have to really, really, really just, yeah, $50,000 a person, and I have to just emphasize that it's taking all of me right now not to curse because I just, if I had hundred million dollars, I could definitely tell you that we'd be doing a lot more with that, and all of us here would probably have a lot less like issues with what our county does. 
you know, people that are new to it and are like, oh, this would be cool to be this, this would be cool to be that. And this stuff is, we've got best practices. HUD, is, HUD has got plenty of direction for us for 50 years working with homeless. We do not need to be making missteps like we are now. So the thing that I would ask you uh, to do is if you're available on uh, November 9th to come to the Hope Community Church between 9 and 3 and take part one of the uh, community-driven fight against homelessness training. So we want to bring the community into the fold. We're going to teach you what we know so that you know what we know so that you can start going in and you can start calling out people who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so we know that we can fight this from the community because we haven't been able to fight it from agencies. We haven't been able to fight it individually, so we have to collectively get together. And we basically have to start a war against homelessness. And there is no money in a war against homelessness, which is why we've never had a war against homelessness. But I know as a community, we can start a war, and we can win this fight. And I know we can end homelessness. They have net zero homelessness in other communities. We can have it too, but we need your help. Thank you. Yes, it's going to be Thursday, November 9th, from 9 to 3 p.m. at Hope Community Church, which is, I believe, at 755 Trademark. Yes, I've got some flyers in the back. Yeah, I would like to say one thing that we didn't talk about okay. uh, are some of the resources that we do have specifically that we are not utilizing. One of the most shocking statistics that I've recently um, discovered is that we have 77 open renal housing authority homes. Yet the waiting list is closed because it's so full. If it were my job to house people, I would start with the empty homes that we have as inventory. It seems, it seems like it's not rocket science, but for some reason we are not utilizing the things that we already have. In addition, we have the Community Assistance Center. That's the CAC over on Record Street, where you can see people who are sleeping outside of a shelter that we paid for that is not being used. This shelter had a medical, a medical center, it has a dining hall, it has a playground, it has a garden, it has or had. Now it is just an boarded up building where people are sitting outside. And we are, we've been told by the city that it is not possible to fix this building, which obviously, of course it is. It's possible to fix any building, right? So we have some negligence going on there where there's been reports of a leaky roof that they just let leak. During COVID, they closed the this shelter and it was primarily used for women and families. You know, uh, about 33 families that are homeless, experiencing homelessness right now, um, as well as uh, the shelter that I'm on the board for, uh, Reno Initiative for Shelter and Equality, is always full. Um, we, and we have families, women, children on the streets. It is mainly women, seniors, and children. These are the most vulnerable people in our community. And we have empty buildings that were used specifically to address this community that, are being, that we are being told cannot be open and there is a more sinister reason behind it. We can talk about where this building is located, conveniently right next to the ballpark. So obviously something's going on there. We're going to, we've been uh, told by the city that there are no plans for this building to be reopened. However, it was only shut because of COVID because people couldn't properly distance. I mean, I suppose you can properly distance now that you live outside. But I don't really think that that was the solution there. And then it was just never reopened. It was supposed to be reopened. And during that time, they let the building deteriorate. It's a $15 million building. Can I interrupt you? Really yes. Fast? I just have to note that apparently COVID is the reason for the to be closed, but bed bugs are not. Right? Yes. So our bed, right. <laughs> the bed bugs from the first campus can get into the VA hospital. But for some reason, that does not cause anyone pause to. Clean it up. And there was mold in the care campus. And I, 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 from my perspective, any brick and mortar building is more is a better investment than a giant tent. It is it is abhorrent the way that we are treating these people. And earlier in uh, 2021, I actually uh, went inside of the care campus myself to take a look and just kind of snuck in there. And uh, the things that I saw were, you know, 
it's absolutely inappropriate, again, comparing it to a prison. People did not break any laws. Um, we need to push the city to open and repair the community assistance center. So please do show up at Sandy Hud City Council meetings and ask them to house our most vulnerable population, fix the roof and fix the building, get it done. They have the money to do, they do have the money to do that. And they spend, the housing authority spends money fixing homes and businesses all the time. We're gonna, we're gonna open it up to a question and answer. Really quick though, I wanna say that this is a city of Reno property that we're talking about. It cost $15 million to build probably 10, 12 years ago. They closed it because of COVID, they claimed. And then they didn't monitor when the roof leaks, as a former property manager, when the roof leaks, they fix the leak. They don't fix the leak, and now they've got other problems. More homes are destroyed by water than fire. We're going to switch off and uh, let uh, some questions be asked and uh, let the panel have a few questions. Thank you. And before we do that, there's a couple of people I met. They're Nicholas St. James is part of the Marshall Major. He brought in They meet on Monday, right? Yeah, Monday night is 30th and 10th. The other one should be. Global, I know it's not a good He's uh, with Turning Point Action Group. And Jackie Hager has her hat. <laughs> come back there. So before you leave, kick up some money and buy some products. And then don't forget, 18th of January, the debate. Now what I'm going to do is we are opening it up for a question from the panel, from the candidates that have spoken, Stephanie. So if you want to ask questions, come here to this seat. We have to capture it on the All right, who wants to ask questions first? You got to come up here. Identify yourself. What city you live in? Let's uh, we'll use this seat for on deck. If anybody else? No. No. On deck. Anybody else gonna have questions after Penny? Come on up. Hi, I'm Penny Brock. I live in Reno. I live in Mike's district, so I was actually not there. Um, my question for Mike is. Tuesday, the county commission meets the second, third, and fourth Tuesday of the month. Next Tuesday, the 24th, they're going to meet at the Sparks Library. Now we've got a problem. Where are we all going to sit? This is a strategic planning meeting. The agenda came out this morning. My question for Mike is, the agenda items are there, but there's no staff reports. We don't, this is about strategic planning. The County Commissioner Eric Brown told us the two top issues to be addressed are seniors, because we've been up there whining about this, and also mental illness. Okay, so Mike, they show no staff reports. We don't know what they're going to show you. The strategic planning meeting in January, there was PowerPoints. Why aren't we seeing that? Can you make sure that's put out for us, please? Thanks for the questions. Good question. The buck doesn't stop here. You know, I'm not involved in the commission uh, agendizing anything. I've asked continuously to be involved in the agenda process, and I'm, I'm not been allowed to do that. So if you all get a chance to talk to Manager Brown, Chair Hill, you might ask them, when can the other commissioners have some involvement in the agenda, the agenda items, and also the location. I, I made a big deal out of this last week County Commission meeting. We've got over 150 seats at the County Commission. We're probably going to have 30, maybe 40 seats available in this little room we're going to use. How does that serve the public? And by moving the county meeting around when people are used to coming to the county chambers, how is that helping the population? We're holding a county commission meeting in Sparks. We should be holding the county commission meeting in the county. That's just fine. 
Sorry, I can't answer your question. Okay, thank you. Um, the meeting starts at 9 o'clock. Usually it's 10. So can you see what's happening there? They don't want us showing up. That's the bottom line. And they really don't want the seniors there because we've been pounding them that we've got a huge problem for seniors. There is no senior center in Reno, South Reno, or Northwest Reno, or where Marsha Bigler lives, or over along the West Front. So I would encourage all of you, please think about showing up at that Sparks Library, 9 o'clock on Tuesday. And the chairman of the county commission is Democrat Alexis Hill. She does not like we the public. She shut down the first comment time. Thankfully for Mike, um, hammering on this every week, and us also, we the public, we've got that back. You can speak for three minutes during the first comment time, the last comment time, and also three minutes after each agenda item. So you're not, you get more than just three minutes. So y'all should turn out and use every three minutes that you can to speak. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for each one of you. Monica, I happen to know, full disclosure, I used to be on Monica's board. I love Madame and Kamara. I know I'm going to do each thing and then I'll get up. You started the pit count. Could you speak? how they handled the pit count this year and how they started it at like 4 a.m. So that's yours. Then, and, and explain to everybody what, okay. <laughs> Lily, so there are supposedly no carts, no um, grocery carts, whatever, on the CARES campus. So all the people who are leaving the CARES campus, walking up to the senior center, and then walking back, where do they store their carts? What's going on? I think you need to better explain something you said that I don't know if the wrong caught. So you said that there is a federal audit that can be asked for. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because this is a room full of people that would ask for a federal audit. Thanks, and thanks everybody for participating today. Uh, so the pit count is a portion of the pit in time count. So HUD requires that each community does a count of their homeless and sheltered once a year. It's usually done during the last week of January. Um, and it's done every single year. And so we still do, uh, our community does a point in time count and uh, they just count adults. Um, I stopped doing the point in time count a couple years ago and no one picked it up and no one continued it after us. And so we did what we would call a homeless youth point in time count and we would do it for the full 24 hours. Um, the adult count is done uh, very early in the morning. I want to say they start about 4 a.m. and they're they're wrapped up and finished about 7 a.m. 8 a.m. Um, so they just count the number of people that they can find during those four hours and then they report on that. But everyone who's in the bubble of homelessness, we know that the HUD point in time count is a very um, it's not a reflective count of, of how many homeless we actually have. It's just their best way that they put together. It's basically kind of give out a national average of what the <coughs> people that they uh, say need housing. So we're like at six million right now, people that need housing in our nation, about six million. What do you think the, what do you think the number is here? Just a rough guesstimate. I can't see sure. a rough guesstimate, uh, an accurate number. So we have 32,000 people that need low income housing. <laughs> Those are people who will never be able to subsidize their own housing. The only way they'll ever get into housing is by us helping them with the subsidy. So 32,000 people. So the longer we keep subsidizing 8% AMI, which is what the city of Reno has decided to do, and higher than that, those people, literally, we have people who will never see a home for the rest of their lives. They'll be in and out of housing programs and shelters, and they'll never get into their own housing. It's very sad. And many of them will be seniors. Thank you. Who's next? Oh, we have three questions. We have, we have three questions. So the third, my question was about the carts. So it is, uh, it is my opinion that these folks should have storage areas for their things. Um, much of the waste that we see, or you know, carts that you see, is because these people don't have access to a, a storage facility. 
Conveniently enough, that community assistance center has lockers. Another wonderful thing that that very well thought out center has. Um, it is possible, I think, that they, uh, per some community suggestions, have put some of those at Karis campus. Um, I don't think that it would be impossible to find a grocery cart uh, stall, but that's still not really solving the problem. The problem is why do people, namely seniors, have to, and women, have to put their things in a cart and push them all around town? So I think that the more that we we address the outskirt outlying issues so that we don't have to actually address the real crisis, which is if people need homes, if people need storage areas. So um, that is what my suggestion would be, would be to get these folks some storage areas, a locker, so that they can have their IDs, their medications, their, um, social, their social security number, cards, and their birth certificates, passports, whatever within some of these lockers, because that is one thing that happens very frequently when we do these cleanups, uh, which I refer to as a sweep. Um, often, many of their belongings are uh, are destroyed, and then we have folks that they can't even get a job because their ID was lost or thrown away. They can't even, you know, all of the materials. I've heard so many people's boot, work boots, their tools are taken and thrown away because they, they feel that people do not want them to work that they want them to be homeless because it is creating very well-paying jobs for some people. Uh, and let's, let's talk about it, right? Let's talk about how some people would be out of the job if we solved the crisis of homelessness. And speaking of that, um, <laughs> so you have a couple options for federal audit. The U.S. Department of Treasury has an office of inspector general that you can file a complaint to. The U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury issues grants specifically in those grants broadly. However, because so much uh, pandemic money was issued, the government actually has a separate pandemic oversight agency. So if you go to pandemicoversight.gov, you can actually easily file a complaint there. If there are any staff members that you know, because I do know that there are some whistleblowers that come through on both parties, um, there's even a whistleblower section of that um, complaint where you can make a complaint as a whistleblower or as an individual. Um, additionally, you can also, and this is kind of where it's funny, right? Because we don't necessarily want self audits, right? So if you and I have to audit ourselves, I'm sure uh, we, we would never have tax issues, right? We pay the government enough. But uh, with that said, we don't necessarily want the same office that controlled the distribution of those funds auditing themselves. So what I would suggest is if someone were confused about what the powers are in the county, to call up the DA's office and ask them what investigatory authority they have. Because one of my biggest concerns, um, and this is not legal advice, but I'm just going to tell you what my big concern is right now, is elder, uh, elder abuse in the Paris campus. I, I am very, very, very concerned about that. I'm concerned about elder abuse in our community as it is, um, especially domestic violence related to elders. But elder abuse um, really kind of was qualified by those uh, caregivers, right? Uh, not properly caring for their seniors. And so I, I would really suggest that all of us stay vigilant on that to make sure that all of our seniors are protected. As you ladies were talking, you talked about all the of dollars, and I kept wondering where do those millions of dollars go to? And you guys already answered, we don't know. So, all these millions of dollars from the federal government, yet we look at the homeless numbers across the country and they're going up. So, obviously, those dollars are being eaten up somewhere, and we're in desperate need of, of audits. I look at uh, federal dollars and other programs just in, in Medicare, they have a seventy billion dollar line item of waste due to fraud. So I would say those eighty seven thousand IRS agents that they want to hire to audit us Americans, they need to audit all the federal programs. So my question is, have you guys reached out to any of our federal elected officials and discussed this? and all of this, and what was their response? 
Uh, <laughs> I recently, um, along with some other concerned community members, drafted a letter of concern to our federal delegation um, regarding the issues that I talked about today and the way that the funds are being used um, with attachments to the memos and the photos of the buildings and uh, all of the things that have been said in, in the various meetings, county and city. I'm outlining our concerns, and I unfortunately that was kind of right. Um, I'm happy to also circulate it if anyone else would like to send this letter because I think it would be helpful for everyone. It's been it was sent September 28th, and I have not received a response. It was uh, received or I have not received a response from the letter sent September 28th. So we're going on a month. And you sent it to every federal. Um, specifically the congressional delegation that deals with housing, HUD, federal HUD, and uh, also CT so that uh, you know, Commissioner Clark was aware of it, the uh, city manager and county manager are aware of it, and uh, no one seems to think that responding was necessary so far. Um, I would also say that it would, it would be such a shame for us to spend even more uh, tax dollars on a settlement for the very real concerns that are criminal that are happening within these institutions. So our two senators don't know what happened. They don't seem to be concerned at the moment. Any other questions? Uh, Alan Wilson. Um, resident of the Washington County. And I just want to follow up on uh, Stephanie's question. So uh, we don't know where the money went and um, who, who knows where, who, who knows where the money is? So ideally, if you look at the distribution of dues and responsibilities, the county manager should know where the money is. And what I can say right now is through my channels, I know that they did not allow um, one of their staff members to buy a golf, a, a golf cart for the Cares campus. So we know that the, the golf cart was not purchased, and that's it. That's, so that wasn't helpful, but the, the county staff and the financial management team, specifically at the county, should know where those county funds went, see what the city is. The city manager and the city staff should know. Um, I'm pretty positive they have an accounting system that they can pr like print out a report and have every have a chart of accounts with every line item. But how do you get it? If Commissioner Clark can't get it and he's on the commission, how would any of us ever even hope to get it? And so, I mean, an, an audit of the COVID funds would be ideal. But how do you get? I mean, does if it's the agenda is only agendized by the county manager and one commissioner. So the only things that are going to make it to the agenda are what those two people want on the agenda. How would we ever get this on the agenda? And I think that is the challenge that we keep running into all the time. It's like we can have all of you come and do public comment, but they have figured out ways now to to um, diffuse our public comments. So by taking it away from us, once you have to fight to get it back. But for some reason, these tactics that were put in place for us to be able to push back, they figured out ways for it to not be effective anymore. And so because that's no longer effective, we have to go back to the drawing board and go, what would get their attention? And so I'm a big proponent on public humiliation and disrupting their uh, private lives. Yes, yes. And so like, you know, stopping them on their way to work, stopping them around their family and friends, like, you know, calling them out for their behavior around the people they actually care about and love versus their job at their job. But they are unfortunately surrounded by a lot of people who are okay with operating that way. So like Harry Potter said, it's hard to call out your enemies, but it's harder to call out your friends. And what I have found in, in, in I don't, I wish I had more time to do research, but if we had a research project around cross boards, how many people sit on the governor's finance committee, sit on the community foundation board, sit on this board, sit on that board? It's like they're controlling all the money. They don't let anybody get in. They just control it all. So we had a 10-unit uh, complex that was 
fully ready for funding and permitting, and we were not awarded HMNI funds. And it was a 50% HMNI or, or 50% AMI for seniors and youth, and we didn't get funding. Whereas we saw other projects who weren't even 25% close to the goal get fully funded. And so there's just a lot of good old boy happening right now in all of our government funds. I just have to say, if you're gonna um, talk to politicians on their way to work or anything, be extra careful because there is a very big litigation budget that the county has for harassment, um, and same goes for cities. And so, uh, of course, try to don't yell, never yell, right? So, to mark this point, this is Mike Clark, County Commission District Two, for the record. I can't get an answer. I can't get a straight answer. I've asked for an audit. I'd like to see an audit on the agenda to vote, have the other commissioners vote on having an audit of, of these funds. And uh, you know, it's a it's a three to two it's a three to two uh, council that we're on now. So there's three people against that idea. There's two people for it. So we've got you know, we've got two county commissioners coming up for election in the very near future, and that's. Uh, District one and district four. So you need to uh, if you want answers, we need one more solid vote on that county commission to get to the bottom of this. And then believe me, if we get one more vote, I will demand and get an audit. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for all being here, Bruce Foster or Sparks. Uh, and I do have a pet peeve and I just wish that everyone recognized what this is. And I know we have a multi-pronged problem. It is huge with the uh, homeless and vacancy issue. But my, this is my pet peeve. I've been a uh, several decade rider along the river, Conwood, Mayberry, Bird Eye Loop, all that back and forth. And thanks to uh, Ride With Mike, uh, we've seen the uh, cars disappear. Talking to the city of Sparks is that they collect them all and they have an individual that they pay that uh, takes them, separates them, and then takes them back. And my question is, is that in there a way, knowing that we're supposed to be a tourist center, and this really detracts from it, and because we see uh, shopping carts all over Washoe County, correct? And uh, isn't there a way that uh, uphold the laws in regards to uh, individuals taking these? And I know they have all their possessions in it. And I know that in uh, Las Vegas, as well as uh, uh, the uh, Clark County, they do have ordinances and they do have things in place where they can put uh, brakes on them if they go out of sight of the uh, shopping jurisdiction. I think that was more of, more of a statement, but I'm going to have to go back to what uh, Ms. Barron said. If we, you know, you've got to have some pity on the people. This is their whole life in the shopping cart. Let's consider if you had to worry about your whole life in the shopping cart. Maybe we can come up with some storage somewhere where people can eat their things. And that way, A, they don't have to have shopping cart go to place. And B, they've got some security. So that's just some compassion. Could, could I chime in there really quickly sure. with that one also? Um, I do want to say that you want to be mindful about criminalizing uh, activities that are associated with homelessness. You're now sending these folks, you're now we're spending a lot of money, right? You get you get the ordinance passed for the shopping cart, okay. So somebody now has the shopping cart and has all their stuff and then they go to jail. They go to court, we've got the court time, we've got the judge's time, all these people are getting paid. Just now the person gets a fine. Are they going to be able to pay the fine? No. What happens when they don't pay the fine? They get a warrant for their arrest. How much, how much does it cost to put that person in jail? Then they get out of jail. They get out of jail. They have nothing. So now they have nothing at all. So now you're opening this person up to maybe other misdemeanors, such as petty theft, such as what a, how is this person going to get a job? We're actually making it much worse when we criminalize these things. Um, there was a bill that uh, Governor Lombardo signed that I helped write SB 155 and Reno has expanded on the bill um, in a way that is really wonderful where they are going to 
when someone is going through court uh, with something that is a crime that is commonly associated with homelessness, they're going to put these people in, in an apartment program, a monitor program, give them whatever service they need through community court, if it's mental health medication, if it's um, you know, rehabilitative services, whatever it is, for one year, that person will receive housing, and that, and that, will, that will close that loop. They're not going to the hospital, they're not going to the jail, it's not costing the taxpayers, these are privately funded things, and that's how we solve the problem. We solve the problems with housing. That is always how we solve it. It doesn't matter if we have legalized shopping carts. Before we go on, I want to acknowledge a couple of people, or a few people, that make Red Boat function. The first is Bill Conrad that is doing all the AV and happens to be running for Senate. Karen Conrad is the treasurer for Red Road and always signs people in. And the two butchers, Janet and Gary, help tremendous. <laughs> Just wanted to thank them. And the other thing is it, again, I keep repeating, don't forget, on the November 8th, veterans get back what you need. We haven't put it out yet, because we had to finish it. And our website, go to redmove.org real soon. It'll be on there. Bill has a nice video. But we need to know how many veterans. Because even the state is bringing some people. So it could get the whole crop. We can handle 150. But with that said, I want to thank everybody. And didn't we have great speakers? Even Mike. Yes. <laughs> you for and, uh, I think uh, Monica, Hava, and Lily would be happy to talk to you. You share contact information, get concerns or things that you might want to talk to them about. Uh, I think that they can make themselves. Yeah, we brought a uh, lunch from the kids in the senior center. Well, then Denise right. also has a the senior service is there a senior services survey too of uh, anyone who wants to fill that out. Yeah. Gray, I have a couple. One question, one statement. Go ahead. Mike and ladies, there are a lot of people who are homeless who refuse to utilize the services available because there are restrictions on them to utilize those services. How do we help them? So they need a different program and they need a different approach. And so things that I would do with those types of folks is just keeping them housed and off of the street, not allowing um, but if we provide housing for them, they don't want to move. It, it wouldn't be that kind of housing. We would basically have to work with what they would be willing to go in. So there's providers, they call like their behavioral health providers, and they can meet these folks where they're at. These folks are not going to work out. They call them system resistant. Um, these folks are not the typical CARES campus. Um, I almost call them like pirates. They like to do things their own way. They're separatists. They made a choice to not be part of the mainstream. And so knowing that you have to work with that type of mindset and not just say, go here, do this. That's a lot of our approach right now, just kind of bossing and ordering people around. And so there are approaches that work with those types of populations, but you wouldn't be doing it in a six to 700 person shelter. You would carve them out into a smaller program so you can manage it. So what percentage of the people, Lily, are those who refuse to utilize the services they're walking in with? Um, yeah, I would say probably 10 or 20 percent, but I would say also that um, there, I, if I were to find myself homeless tomorrow, I would not go to the CARES campus at all. I would be, because I would be worried about being sexually assaulted, murdered, witnessing trauma. When you do uh, public records requests on calls to service, you see back-to-back -back suicides, overdoses, stabbings, shootings. I'd be resistant to that service also. Oh, so wow. the thing is, what we have to do, as Monica said, is we need to take that, take these folks and ask them. These, just because you're homeless doesn't mean you're no longer an adult. Adults don't like being told what to do. If somebody told me I have to move into a box and I can't cook for myself, yeah, that doesn't sound great, you know? 
So I think that what we do, we have to do is have a varying amount of services. We have to try to see what it is that people need, help the most vulnerable first, and unfortunately it's a case-by-case -case basis. But I promise you there is not a singular person that would want to live in the shambles and have nowhere to go to the bathroom, have nothing, nowhere to find where the next meal is. That's just not human nature. Well, and the same goes for just seniors across the board, though. And not every senior can be treated the same way. You can't stick every single senior into an independent living or into a group home. That's just not feasible at all. So when it comes down to it, we have to have options. And we have to have different approaches. Some seniors want to live in their homes forever. And that's fine, but we're going to still have to be able to provide these services. And I keep hearing about options, but I don't see options either. We agree. Correct. Okay. Now, my statement has nothing, has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. But I used to be the host of Conversations from the Capitol, which was the American Matters radio show. I left, went back to college. Now I'm back, and then my family says, you got to get back on the air. So that's going to happen a week from tomorrow, on the 27th of October. Conversation from the Capitol is very much involved in politics. But may I express again conversations from the Capitol? So we're going to have as many of the candidates as we can. We're going to have as many people who want to speak about something in the political world and so forth. They'll be on. We're on from 11 to noon on Fridays on America Matters. Radio, which is 73.7 FM. Mark and 93.7. 93.7. Yeah. Yeah. I said 77. Didn't I? Mm -hmm. 93.7. So everybody's welcome. Uh, the front part of the studio will be open again for audience, and an audience will have a mic and they can join with us. I think that you'll find it very informative and that you'll enjoy our. Uh, approach to conversations about politics. Thank you. Tom, thank you for your question about how do you work with service-resistant people because that is such a great question that we can't have a conversation about in the room in the county. We can't. They will not even have that conversation about what do you do with someone who doesn't want to stay at the shelter? What do you do with someone who wants to stay drunk or high all day long? What do you do with someone who has, has a sex offender background and no housing program will take them in? What do you do with someone who's in a wheelchair and cannot be accepted into any shelter? We have a lot of populations right now that we have no policy around, and we aren't even willing to have the conversation in the room. The people who have, who are in the position to lead these conversations will not even allow us to speak about it. So that, that what you just asked, that's one of the greatest questions that I've ever even heard opened up. And it's not even happening in a housing like meeting. It's happening in here. One of the things that I mentioned to people Everybody should be involved with politics. And most people tell me that they don't want to be involved with cesspool. So if you're part of my term here, as I go into it, there's two things that race to the top. One is cream and bottle of milk, the other in terms of cesspool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you uh, for, for answering the, the question and asking the questions, Tom. Uh, would you be? Uh, would you consider having these uh, ladies on your radio program to, to post a message even further? Yes, sir. we can have all three, but we're limited in our time. So, yeah, if you want to come, time, yeah. if you want to come as the person, that's absolutely fine. You can come with them also, Mike. Everybody is welcome. Thanks, Mike. But <laughs> the uh, the situation is, all you have to do is get a hold of me. And you call. Or uh, call America Matters and tell them you want to get on conversations from the Capitol. And as soon as we get on the air, we'll have more information about how to contact people. And I make a here. comment. In the past, for several years, yeah, it was an excellent show. It used to be at the old studio and the mall, but not the new one. And he'll do a good job. You know, as Ray said in the past, it's going to continue, right? So I've got uh, two more comments. I want to, uh, I went to talk uh, uh, Denise Myers went by uh, the senior center and picked up the lunch today. I want all of you to look at this lunch and see if you would eat it yourself or offer it up to one of your loved ones. Take a look at that. I 
that's, that's what the picture is passing on. And let me finish one other item. I forgot to mention that Pat Newman here is here in the audience, and she's on the city of Reno senior advisory. So Pat has taken some notes and we're going to be taking his, his comments and questions back to the city of Reno and sharing that with them. So thanks for coming out today, Pat. So just keep in mind that this is a four dollar lunch. The seniors have to pay four dollars for it. If they want soup, it's a dollar more. So you want what? Soup. Oh. Soup. Any other comments? Any other questions? We're going to wrap it up. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, one of the things you guys have been fighting is getting things on the agenda for the county commission. And uh, according to the rules of procedures, uh, uh, Mike and Dean both can put request to put something on. And, the, and so, as, as attorneys, you guys know you need to document everything. And so, with uh, with them requesting to put items on the agenda according to the rules of procedure 5.2, any commissioner can request put something on the agenda. There's only two reasons they can keep it off. One, it's not lawful. The other one is that it's not the administration purview of the county. So all the stuff that we've been asking for is, um, it, it fits in both of those. And so we need to start building that case because every time uh, Hill violates it, it's a violation of her ethics, misfeasance, and malfeasance. Thanks for pointing that out. That as a sitting county commissioner, I have zero influence over the county. I can't get anything I want out of you. That's just the way it is. So you can quote this, that, and the next thing until the cows come home. But at the end of the day, the county denies me the process of doing that. So other than duress or you know, some outrageous act on my part, how do I get that to happen? You saying it and getting done are two different things. They're totally disconnected. There's no accountability. I will say to uh, pressuring the Ethics Commission, we have several members in office with multiple ethics violations and it seems as if you can just have as many as you like. It's almost as if they're competing to see who can get the most at this point. Um, and unfortunately that that uh, that entity is also not so I you know put some pressure on the ethics commission to actually do something also. The problem is the ethics commission If only we were in a room full of Republicans with a Republican governor. Someone should really call him up and tell him they get his appointments for her. Uh, once again, very little conversation about uh, veterans that are also seniors. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Here we go again. Yeah. They want to put their lives on the line for this country, and that's why. He can't get their stuff on his agenda either. Again, I know chapter one. If you want to say thank the people, I thank you for coming in. November the eighth. Lovely. Thanks for not crazy.